I want to invite you to take your Bibles and turn with me to Revelation chapter 21, looking at verses 9 through, through 27, 21, 9 through 27. While you're turning there, I want to invite you to return tonight uh, to the regular schedule, beginning with youth group dinner at 530. Uh, in the evening service, we're beginning a series into the fall on John 17, Jesus' high priestly prayer, as it's sometimes called. Uh, we, we refer to the Lord's Prayer. Well, John 17 is Jesus' own prayer, the Lord's own prayer. What would it be like to sit in and listen as Jesus prays in extended prayer? Well, we have the privilege of doing that in John chapter 17. So hope to see you tonight as we begin a series of studies in that prayer. But this morning, we are in Revelation 21, beginning in verse 9. Hear the word of God. Then came one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues and spoke to me, saying, Come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great high mountain and showed me the holy city Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, having the glory of God, its radiance like a most rare jewel, like a jasper, clear as crystal. It had a great high wall with 12 gates, and at the gates, 12 angels, and on the gates, the names of the 12 tribes of the sons of Israel were inscribed. On the east, three gates, on the north, three gates, on the south, three gates, and on the west, three gates. And the wall of the city had 12 foundations, and on them were the 12 names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. And the one who spoke with me had a measuring rod of gold to measure the city and its gates and walls. The city lies four square, its length the same as its width. And he measured the city with his rod, 12,000 stadia, its length and width and height are equal. He also measured its wall, 144 cubits by human measurement, which is also an angel's measurement. The wall was built of jasper, while the city was pure gold, like clear glass. The foundations of the wall of the city were adorned with every kind of jewel. The first was jasper, the second sapphire, the third agate, the fourth emerald, the fifth onyx, the sixth carnelian, the seventh chrysolite the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth chrysoprase, the eleventh jacinth, the twelfth amethyst. And the twelve gates were twelve pearls, each of the gates made of a single pearl. And the street of the city was pure gold, like transparent glass. And I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God the Almighty and the Lamb. And the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and its lamp is the Lamb. By its light will the nations walk, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it, and its gates will never be shut by day, and there will be no night there. They will bring into it the glory and the honor of the nations, but nothing unclean will ever enter it, nor anyone who does what is detestable or false but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. Can we give thanks to God for his holy word. Let's pray. Father, open our eyes that we might see wonderful things in your word. Father, we pray that your spirit would teach us. Father, give us malleable hearts that you would shape us according to your word. And Father, feed our souls we're hungry, Lord, for you. Pray that we could be nourished on the manna of the word of God. And Father, we worship you as we hear and think about your word. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Then came one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues and spoke to me saying, Come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. You may be forgiven if you have a sense of deja vu when we read that because it is an echo of what we read back in chapter 17, verse 1. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and said to me, Come, I will show you the judgment of the great prostitute 
who is seated on many waters. No coincidence, actually, uh, in the similarity. In fact, I think it is purposely worded in a very similar way because it's meant to draw a contrast between the prostitute of Babylon on the one hand and the new Jerusalem, the bride of Christ, on the other. As someone put it, John now sees the genuine bride of whom the harlot Babylon was a shoddy counterfeit. John was, as he says, carried away in the Spirit. That is, the Lord is giving him a new vision. The Spirit is not so much removing him physically from somewhere, but carrying to a place to receive this Spirit. <clears throat> and we read earlier, he was taken to the wilderness to see the harlot Babylon. Now, typically in Revelation, as we've seen, the wilderness can be a good place. Uh, the church, chapter 12, was removed there and kept safe by God. But in this case, I think it speaks more uh, negatively, the wilderness, the barren place where he sees the prostitute Babylon. But here he's taken instead to a giant high mountain. Now, there's an Old Testament background to that. In fact, there's a, a, a lot of Old Testament background to this passage. But the, the background being put on the mountain is Ezekiel 40. Well, there we read Ezekiel, after seeing the defeat of Gog and Magog, is himself taken to and placed on top of a very high mountain. And from that mountain, he sees that vision of the end times temple, that temple that takes up a number of chapters there at the end of Ezekiel. And uh, Ezekiel sees that and is shown that in great detail uh, from the top of the mountain. Well, here we are. John is placed on top of this mountain and from there, he sees this vision of a city. And it really is a fulfillment of what Ezekiel saw. And here's John having the same experience, seeing what Ezekiel saw, but really seeing the reality to which those closing chapters of Ezekiel pointed. And there's a vision of this city, but what a city. It's like no other. And when is a city not a city? Well, when it's a symbol, a symbol of the church. Why do I say that? Well, I say it because the angel said it. Couldn't be any plainer. The angel says to John uh, there in the first verse of our passage, Come, I will show you what? The bride, the wife of the lamb. Very clearly, the church. The church is described throughout Scripture as the bride of Christ. In fact, even in the Old Testament, Israel was described as the bride or the wife of her husband, the Lord God. An unfaithful one, all too often, to be sure. Read the book of Hosea uh, with Gomer and his, uh, or Hosea and his wife Gomer is sort of a picture of that. But then certainly in the New Testament, where Paul, for example, Ephesians 5, maybe the best known reference, uh, talks about marriage, where the, the, the husband, the wife, are a picture of Christ and his church and the relationship that is there. So, but the angel very clearly says, I will show you the bride, the wife of the lamb. And so here we see this, this imagery of a city that depicts the church, us, the redeemed. And here we learn four things about the church in the new heavens and new earth, that is, in its final eternal state. This is an image that's meant to communicate things to us about the church. First of all, the church will be beautiful. The church is beautiful here in this heavenly context. And we see that in verse 11, and then again in 18 through 21, verse 11, having the glory of God. John is describing this, this holy city, Jerusalem. Earlier, it's called the New Jerusalem. It's the same here, the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. It's described as his creation, his doing, God's doing, and having the glory of God, its radiance, like a most rare jewel, like jasper, clear as crystal. And so the overall impression is just of this, of light, of, of brilliance, radiance, shining. It's said here that it's like jasper, kind of like some of the animals in Deuteronomy in the Old Testament. It's a little tricky to pin down exactly what, what animals referred to precisely that would 
that would correspond to the animals we know. Most of them are pretty clear. Some of them is uncertainty. Well, same with these jewels. With Jasper, uh, is actually not transparent, uh, it's, and yet he says here it is clear as crystal. And the point being, again, just light. It's it's shining. It's radiant. Um, some even see this maybe as a reference to diamonds and, and their brilliant flashing light. But the point is plain. The bride's appearance is radiant. It's magnificent as a bride would be on her wedding day. And in verses 18 and following, John continues to describe the beauty of this city bride. The walls are jasper, but the city itself is pure gold, he says, like clear glass. Now, we don't think of gold as being clear or transparent, but again, John is trying to describe in human words things that are beyond words to describe. It's like gold, and yet it's clear, it's shiny, it's radiant. And so he's, he's doing a good job conveying the brilliance of it. And then in verse 19, the foundations of the wall of the city were adorned with every kind of jewel. And he goes through that list that we read of all of those jewels that are there with the, the walls, the foundations of the, the wall of the city. And the impression is just that of glorious color. He says the gates of the city itself are 12 pearls each gate carved from a single pearl. It's magnificent. The street of the city, here we have gold again, is pure gold again. It's like transparent glass. This gold color and yet shiny, transparent, brilliant. Now, back in verse 11, John said this city has the glory of God. It has the glory of God. In other words, it's radiant the way God is radiant. And remember back in Revelation 4, Remember four and five or that initial throne room scene after the letters to the seven churches, that view John has of the throne of God in heaven. And four, three, John writes, and he who sat there <clears throat> on the throne had the appearance of Jasper and Carnelian, and around the throne was a rainbow that had the appearance of an emerald. Again, the, the picture of God is that of glory and color and radiant brilliance. And he's saying that's what this is like. That's what the church looks like. Remember God's command to Israel in the Old Testament, you shall be holy because I am holy. You sh in other words, like God in his holiness. But how much the church is, is like God in this holy beauty. Uh, so much so he could say we have the glory of God. And that now characterizes the church of, his, uh, of God, that is his people. Now remember, as we've gone through Revelation, we've said that the purpose of these images and some of them are difficult to nail down or even somewhat fluid and changing. The point is not so much to show what something looks like as what something is like. In other words, don't think Jesus literally has a sword coming out of his mouth. No, but Jesus does communicate the word of God. He is God and he speaks the word of God. That's the point. And so what is the church like in heaven? Well, it's not a cube. But it is magnificent. It is brilliant. The church may not look that way now, but it will look that way then in the new creation. It'll be pure, beautiful, radiant, having around it the glory of God. It is what God is making us to be. Sinless, glorified in a new heavens and a new earth. Dear friend, whatever your assessment of the church now, never forget that God is making his church, which is made up of his people, us. He's making his church to be a glorious thing, a radiant bride fit for the king of kings. And let that shape, let that influence your assessment, your estimate of the church now. Sometimes it can be easy to look at the church now and be discouraged. If that happens, remind yourself what God is making the church, what his church will one day be. Beautiful, radiant, magnificent. Second, the church is not only beautiful, it's secure. We see that in verses 14 through 16. John describes this, this city, this odd city, as having a great high wall with 12 gates. Now, of course, in ancient times, cities had walls to protect the city 
People had to enter and leave the city, and so the gates served that purpose, but they themselves were fortified, could be closed to hold out attackers. But this city is the eschatological Jerusalem. This is the, the new creation city. This is the church in glory. Why does it need a wall to protect it? Well, in any case, we're told that the gates are never shut. Uh, after all, all the enemies are in the lake of fire at this point, and indeed they are. But the wall is part of the imagery of, a, of the city, as it's described, and the walls convey the impression of security, of safety, that in heaven we will fully be safe and secure from all alarms, as the hymn puts it. And there's another image of security here in heaven. One is the wall, but then there is another one that we've already seen uh, in Revelation earlier and also drawn from Ezekiel, and that is measuring. Uh, verse 15, the one who spoke with me had a measuring rod of gold to measure the city and its gates and its walls. And if you go back to 11, chapter 11, Revelation 11, verse 2, we read, then I was given a measuring rod like a staff, and I was told, rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and those who worship there, but do not measure the court outside the temple. Leave that out. It's given over to the nations. They'll trample the holy city for 42 months. But even before that, in Ezekiel 40, after Ezekiel was set on the high mountain where he sees the, this temple, he writes of seeing a man whose appearance is like bronze, and he has a linen cord, and he has a measuring reed in his hand. And then as you read through those chapters, you go with Ezekiel and with this odd tour guide as they go through the temple and measure this and measure that and measure the other and the measurements and the measurements on for chapters and, and chapters. Measures everything. What does all this measuring mean? Well, it's a way of expressing knowledge. We even use the expression today, take the measure of a man. What do we mean? We mean assessing him. Well, measuring here conveys knowledge, and therefore it conveys that God knows us. We are secure. We are safe in the knowledge of God. God knows us. He knows everything about us. He keeps us in his grace. And unlike the earthly temple, this end times temple uh, that Ezekiel saw, even from the Old Testament, in a way, it was different, described differently, but represented the same thing. And the one that John sees fulfilled here, it is utterly safe. Nothing, no one can harm it, can do it damage. And that's just a way of conveying that as Christians, we are utterly secure. We will be utterly safe in heaven. Nothing can harm us. Not even we ourselves. Remember, Jesus said, no one can snatch them out of my hand. In the Garden of Eden, go back to the beginning of the Bible, Adam was able to sin against God. He was able to obey, but he was also able to sin against God. And that, as you know, is exactly what he did. But if he obeyed God, it does seem that he would have been able to eat of the tree of life. He would have been confirmed in this holy, sinless existence, never to sin again. Well, he failed the test. We know that. He ate, Eve ate, he ate. But Christ... The second Adam did not fail. He passed the test. He obeyed perfectly, even when the serpent threw his worst at him in the wilderness. Jesus passed the test for us. And in heaven, we will be confirmed in righteousness. We will be unable to sin. There's no possibility that billions and billions of eons in the future, someone's going to sin again and restart the whole thing. It's not going to happen. We will be confirmed in righteousness in Christ, only able to obey and glorify and enjoy God. Dear friends, we will be secure in heaven, and nothing will ever disrupt or threaten that. Third, we see that the church is complete. See this in verses 12 through 21, and that completeness is seen in a number of ways. First, it's seen in the names that are on the city. We read how on the gates, there were angels there, kind of divine oversight and, and protection. But on the gates of the names were the, uh, the gates were the names of the tribes of Israel. In fact, as you read it, three to the east, three to the south, three to the west. If you read in the Old Testament, that was Israel's camp formation. The tribes were arranged in that way around the tabernacle. 
three to the east, three to the west, and so forth, exactly as it's described here. And the names of the tribes of Israel were on them. And then on the foundations of the wall were the names of the twelve apostles. Presumably not Judas Iscariot, whether the twelfth was Matthias, chosen in the book of Acts, or the apostle Paul, called by God, I will leave you to ponder and wonder. But that's really beside the point. The point is that the completeness is seen in these names, the 12 tribes of Israel representing the old covenant people of God, the 12 names of the apostles representing the new covenant people of God, all together as one in Christ, now redeemed in glory. All God's people are there. Not one of those for whom Jesus died is lost. And this is the whole redeemed people of God from all time. It's complete. And that's seen in the names. It's also seen in the size of the city. All that measuring reveals the size of this city. And it is gigantic. 12,000 stadia. Is that a few meters? Maybe a mile? Try about 1,400 miles. Roughly New York City to Houston. This is a big city. And we're told that it's four square and the wall is 216 feet. That's what the, the cubits measure out to. It's 216 feet. High? Wide? It doesn't say, but either way, it's kind of a, a dinky wall compared to the massive size of the city. Because it's not just 1,400 by 1,400 miles square, but it's 1,400 miles high. This is a cube. This picture a Rubik's Cube, yeah, but, but bigger. And you probably can't solve it. But, you know, a cube, right? Which should scream at us, this is a symbol. No city is a cube. How does that even work? No, it's meant to be a symbol, and more on the significance of the cube shape in a moment. But the sheer size points to its capacity. It holds everybody. Like Noah's Ark, it holds everybody it's meant to hold in this new Jerusalem. It is complete, and the size shows that. And then its completeness is also seen in the jewels that are listed there. And the jewels, as we said, point to the beauty, but they also represent something else. Remember with Aaron, the high priest of Israel, and that ephod that was made, that vest that he wore, it had what on the front? It had 12 jewels representing the 12 tribes of Israel, that he would go into the Holy of Holies, bearing Israel on his chest, as it were, representing them before God. And so those stones correspond roughly, the ones here in Revelation, to roughly correspond to those stones that were on the the breastplate, the ephod, of the high priest. And they show that the prerogative of the high priest uh, to, of the, to go into the presence of God in the Holy of Holies now belongs to everyone. That everyone dwells in the presence of God at that time, just like the high priest was able to go in then. So it points to completeness. All these stones represent the people of God, and they're all there. The whole 12. Not one is lost. Not one of those who believe in Christ will be abandoned or will fall away. They will all be there. The city will be full. The bride will be complete. And then fourth, the church is holy. The church is holy. It's secure. It's beautiful. It's complete. But it's also holy. You see this in verse 16 and then on to 22 through 27. I saw no temple in the city. For its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. There's no temple in the New Jerusalem. There was one in the Old Jerusalem. There's not one in the New. Why? Well, there's no need. What did the temple represent? The temple represented the dwelling place of God in the midst of his people, a a holy presence mediated with sinners by means of the sacrifices. Of course, Christ has died, fulfilling the sacrifices. There's no need for the temple to rebuilt, be rebuilt. There's no need for sacrifices ever to be offered again. Christ has done that. But what did the temple represent? The presence of God with his people, which is precisely what is, is happening here. God is now present with his people in the way all the others pointed to. The tabernacle, the temple, the incarnation of God in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, the giving of the Holy Spirit. 
And now we don't have to be in some physical location to worship God. We worship in any, anywhere. This is not a temple. This is a convenient place, an air conditioned, thankfully, to be able to worship God. But all of that is pointing forward to the New Jerusalem when God Himself will be there. There's no temple because God Himself is there and all of His holiness is there. And it says there's no sun or moon. Why not? Well, verse 23 the glory of God gives it light. And its lamp is the Lamb. Now remember, we're speaking symbolically. I think there will be a universe in the new creation that would have a sun like this. But the point is, God is present. His holiness, the, the holiness of the Lamb, and their, their, their character, their presence lights up the place. After all, God is not dependent on the sun for light. He created light before He created the sun. Light is God's creation. Verses 24 through 26 have puzzled many. By its light will the nations walk, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it, and its gates will never be shut by day, and there will be no night there. They'll bring into it the glory and honor of the nations. Well, how does that work? Well, some would see this as a li the literal nations of the world bringing their tribute into a literal earthly New Jerusalem in an earthly millennial reign, thousand-year reign, of the Lord Jesus Christ. But that does create some problems if you take it that way, not least of which is we're told there's no night there, which if it's on this earth, there would continue to be night. Um, so who are these who are coming into the city bringing their tribute? Well, I think it's better to take it as fulfillment of an Old Testament image taken from Isaiah and hints of it in other places. But in Isaiah 60, there's a prophetic description of the nations bringing their tribute to and making pilgrimage to Jerusalem. And it was Isaiah looking forward to the new covenant and ultimately to this ultimate salvation itself. And that imagery is reflected here. What is the point of the nations bringing their tribute in? Well, the point is they're there. They're present. The believing Gentiles, the nations, will never be separated from eternal access to God's presence. And nothing can threaten that access to God. Even in the Old Testament, the day was envisioned when the, when the good news and God's covenant and grace would go out to the nations of the earth. And you see that at least beginning to be fulfilled in the book of Acts as the gospel goes out to the ends of the earth as it continues to do to this present day. There's a sense in which you could say that the nations coming in is simply pointing out to the, to the international and breadth and diversity of the people of God from every tribe and tongue and language. So who will not be there? Those whose behavior indicates that they are without the grace of God in Christ. And verse 27 points to that where it tells us that they are not there. Nothing unclean will ever enter into it or be there, uh, nor anyone who does what's detestable or false, only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. Again, salvation is not by works. Those who, the Lamb's book of life was not the books with works written in it. It was the books, names were written in it from before the foundation of the world. The elect, the, in those Jesus died for, the redeemed, those who believe in him <clears throat> and are saved by his grace. But those whose behavior shows that they know nothing of Christ, that they are none of his, that they do not belong to him, they will not be there. Only those in the Lamb's book of life, those redeemed by the, the Lamb, by God's grace. It is a little curious, and if you've been tracking with us through this, maybe you've noticed this. The last three passages that we've studied here in Revelation all end, after portraying the glories of salvation, all end with a reference to the lost. Why is that? I think I know. I think it does that to warn us that while there will be a vast host there in the glories of heaven, not everyone will be there. And we will not be there automatically. But there are those who will be in hell, those who will be in the lake of fire. I think it's meant to press the question once again. I think John does this, pressing the question once again, which are you? Where will you be? Are you in Christ? Have you believed in him? Will you be a part of this city 
the beautiful bride of Christ, the church, on that day. Let's pray. Father, by your grace, may we be there. Father, we know there will be those under your judgment. But Lord, give us ears to hear. Give us eyes to see Jesus, who he is, the Lamb of God, Savior of sinners, to believe in him, to be saved, to continue in him and be saved. And we pray it in his name. Amen.